Good evening, everyone, and thanks for once again tuning in to be a part of our Wednesday night Bible study. We are finishing up our study of the Gospel of John tonight. And if you've been with us, this is 16 lessons that we have studied from John 1. Now as we finish tonight, John chapter 21. I promised you when we began this study that we would take our time, we would look from verse by verse and see John's Gospel come to life. And I pray that it has done that for you as we've studied together. This has been the second time in the last seven years here that I've been able to lead a group of people through this study. This has been unusual. We've done it online, digitally, from each other. And so there's been very little interaction. Time for us to talk together, to grow together as we read the passages with one another to be able to bounce ideas and reflections back and forth and to just see how our life fits into this and what it teaches us. But you know what? Technology has allowed us to at least be together. It's not the together we'd like, but it is a together we have. And I know, and I know that you know, that we're excited. A vaccine's on its way. Some people here in our great commonwealth have already taken it. And it looks like in the near future, you and I will be able to get back to some sense of what life was like before the pandemic. But if during our time here, we've learned more about God, we've learned to be patient, to endure, if we've learned that, well, there's a few more ways we can study the Bible than we were doing before. If we've learned all of that, then a blessing will come from this. If it's simply taught us to appreciate what we have, then a great lesson can be learned. Tonight, John chapter 20 and chapter 21, we will see that this, this gospel written, that we may know Jesus Christ as the Son of God, was written for you and me and for people of all time. To see behind the curtain, to reflect upon who Jesus was when very few people were looking, and to know that our our Savior is the Son of God. So here's what I want to do. I want to pause the video in just a second, and I want you to go to our website, TompkinsvilleCoc.com. I want you to print off the study guide for tonight. It's called The Sun Rises, and you will find that there are four sections. Section number one with the empty tomb, number two when Jesus meets with a group, number three, Doubting Thomas, and finally number four, Breakfast by the Sea. And you'll see that all of those sections allow us to appreciate what has unfolded in these last two chapters. So, pause the video, go to our website, either download those to your digital device or print them on your home printer, and be able to follow along as we read. John 20. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. When he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself, then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. And he saw, and he believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Mary, supposing him to be the gardener, said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. But Jesus said to her, Mary. She then turned 
and said, Rabbi, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but I go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene then came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, that he had spoken these things to her. There's an awful lot for us to be thankful for when we read the gospel account. The miracles, the times Jesus healed someone, his lessons. There might not be anything we can be more thankful for, though, than his death, his burial, and his resurrection. There's a few points I want you to see on your handout, section number one, when we discuss the empty tomb. There are several blanks, so let's start with letter A. I want you to notice that Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week, Sunday morning. The very first day of the, the Jewish week, the very first day uh, when they would get up and, and life would begin again after the rest on the Sabbath, the first day of the week. That's why we worship on Sundays. And that's when he rose. Notice letter B. When Mary Magdalene got to the tomb, it was empty. The stone had been rolled away. She did not find him there. Neither did his other disciples, for he was already gone. The disciples found Jesus' burial clothes, letter C says. They were folded. They weren't just scattered as if he had been snatched they had been carefully wrapped and put back into place. Letter D. What's worth noting here is that they did not fully understand everything that was happening. Now John could, by hindsight, say, you know, later on we, we knew what was going on, but in that moment, they didn't. It's a shame that they didn't, but, but it shouldn't be that shocking to us. For many of the things Jesus did, they were, they were really caught off guard by. They still were looking with these eyes, with this physical mindset. And he was pleading with them to think spiritually, to think inwardly. Look, look, at, look at big picture items. That's okay. Don't, don't feel too harsh for them. I believe you and I would have been guilty of the same thing. Letter E, I want you to notice that when the apostles left, that Mary remained. Why? I don't know. Maybe she was confounded, maybe she was upset, maybe she was struggling to deal with it. Maybe she had hoped that someone would be there and she could talk to them. She saw the two angels. When the angels asked her, what, why are you weeping? Her response is very simple, that they took Jesus. They, they took him. She had gone there to pay her respects, and I imagine she had planned to come back and pay respects over and over and over again to the man who had been her savior, a teacher, someone who validated and believed in her, when maybe many didn't. That's when he speaks up. So that's letter F. That when Jesus appeared and spoke to her, she still didn't know it was him. Not until he said, Mary, Mary. And with that being said, I think we see the, the reality of life when it's confusing. Sometimes we think that, that everyone in the moment has, should have the ability to understand what's going on, but we don't. It's like right now with the pandemic. We're living through it. Now, years from now, we'll have hindsight. And we'll be able to second-guess decisions that were made and choices and and, and comments that people made, social media, to their friends. We'll be able to have an autopsy, you might say, of the last few months. Please beg me. I, I don't mean that to be a pun. That, that's just what it will be. And we will measure all that's happened, all that was lost, all, all that was gained. And then we'll be able to make a statement. And we'll understand. We're confused now, just like they were confused then. Because when you don't have the beauty of hindsight, life seems very complicated. And even ordinary things that are explainable, they aren't. Let's take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment to look at verses 19 through 23. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We're looking at a section, second section of our Final lesson tonight, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. Let's go ahead and read them before we look at some of the answers on your study guide. 
Starting in verse 19, it says that then, the same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This short passage here is not very complicated, but gives us a glimpse at the first time Jesus spent with a group, a, 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 a large group of his disciples, and it's recorded in Scripture after his resurrection. Now, a lot of the times during Jesus' resurrection, these 40 days from the time he rose from the grave and ascended to be at the right hand of the throne of God, Jesus is somewhere that we don't see. All the details of every moment are not shared with us. I'd love to know where he spent most of that time, who he spent that time with. And I have a theory in my mind that he went to a lot of these people who he had changed and impacted their life, that he saw blind Bartimaeus again. That he saw the leper who was healed, who came back and said thank you. That he saw Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. That he saw the woman at the well. That, that's my theory. And I, I won't 100% ever be able to support that. But I believe that makes sense. That all the work he did before, he validated in seeing those people after. I wish I could tell you I know that's true. I think some time he spent with his brothers and sisters, his real brothers and sisters, his half-brothers and sisters. I think that's part of the reason why James believes so much that he can write in his epistle that he is a servant, a servant of the Son of God. Notice four things. On your handout, starting in letter A, section number two, about Jesus meeting with the group. That the disciples were still afraid, letter A, they were afraid of what the Jews would do to them. They were afraid of what the people who put Jesus on the cross would do to them now. And they were afraid because people knew whose disciple they were. They were Jesus' disciples. I, I think fear is common to, to all of us. We're all afraid of something. And I, I don't know what you're afraid of today, but we're all afraid and it shouldn't be lost on us that one of the most common commands in all of Scripture that God tells us is do not be afraid. Do not fear. So many times he tells us, I'm with you. Part of the reason that the pandemic has been so frightening to many of us is because we've forgotten that God was with us. That none of this caught him off guard. Do not be afraid. Even though that's typically what we are. Let it be, Jesus showed his disciples what? He showed them his wounds. We talked about his hands, side. Why would he do that? You know, not to be too obvious here, but just to prove that he was who he said he was, that he, he was real, that, that he, he was a physical form of being. Now, I, I tend to believe, and I think many people do as well, that this was his resurrected body, similar to what ours may be like, when this world ends, that it might not have been exactly flesh and blood like we are flesh and blood. If that's true, okay. What I know to be true is that the wounds were there. So there's definitely, when you look at that body, the body that hung on the tree. So what will ours be like one day? I don't know. That, that's a, a time for a study on another day. And Maybe we'll be able to have that before the pandemic is over. All I need to know is that they recognized him and that they saw on his hands and in his side what had happened to him. This wasn't some fluky figment of their imagination, some spiritual apparition. This was Jesus, the man who they sat with, who they ate with, who they walked with, and they lived with. There he was, alive again. Let her see. It's in verse 22 that it says Jesus breathed on them and told them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now this seems to be a, a warm-up, an appetizer, an early onset um, of the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
That occurs to its fruition in Acts chapter 2, when the tongues of fire descend from heaven, they rest upon the apostles, and then following that they're able to speak in tongues. I, I, I'm not sure 100% that this would have given them any miraculous power. But I believe this is an early, simple precursor to the formal event that would draw the crowd in and beget the beginning of the church there in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. What I want you to see, letter D, is the spiritual implication of them receiving the Holy Spirit, the message that God would give, the words of the gospel. It would give them the power to forgive sins. I don't want you to confuse that with anything other than the power of the message they would teach. For the message they were about to give through inspiration of the Holy Spirit would be the words that those people used to find salvation and the words you and I still use to this day to find salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was true then and it's true now. And it's how you and I find our salvation in our response to the gospel message. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Absolutely. I know it. The last section in chapter 20 is verses 24 through 31. And I want you to read this with me, and we'll finish this section in just a moment. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. Our third section. We only have two more left, and we will be done with our study of the book. In verse 24, it says that Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve apostles, was not with the group when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. He said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside. And I think we presume they were inside the same place. And Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came, the doors being shut, stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. Same thing he said earlier. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. And reach your hand there and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas then answered and said to Jesus, My Lord, my God, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. When we read these verses, we find the impetus for the entire study. We find our theme, and we, we find a beautiful promise made to Thomas and then to you and me. So let's look on your handout. Section number three, letter A. Thomas was also called the twin, something that's newly mentioned here. That's something a close friend, a confidant would know. John writing that about his friend. Notice that Thomas doubts. Why did he doubt? We call him Doubting Thomas, but, but let's be honest. Why did he doubt? Because he hadn't seen him. Would you and I have doubted as well? I have a hard time believing that you answer that question any way but the way I would. Yes, of course we would have. How many times have you seen someone risen from the grave? Now, we'll pause for a minute. We'll say that Thomas had seen Lazarus risen from the grave. So if anyone was ever going to believe it, it would have been one of them. But I would have doubted too, and I think you might have as well. So don't stand on some holier-than-thou, high, mighty position and say, Oh, Thomas is a doubter and I'm not. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Thomas was a human being. And while he should have known better, we should know better, yet we still don't. When he believed, notice that Jesus does not, doesn't correct him, does, doesn't try to make him feel bad, doesn't say, why didn't you know, and smack him across the head. He just said, blessed are you for believing. What? Why? Why? 
Because you have seen, you have believed. And blessed are those who have not seen and believed. That encourages me, letter C, and I hope you. Because we are the people he's talking about there. We are blessed. Because we have faith. Hebrews tells us that faith is the assurance of things you hope for. It's the evidence of things that you have not seen. I have not seen Jesus Christ in the flesh, yet I believe he was here. I did not see him perform the miracles, yet I believe he did. I didn't hear his words, but I believed them as if I did. And I didn't watch him die on the cross, but I believe he said it is finished. And I believe Thomas put his hand right here. He felt the imprint of where the nail was. I believe that. And I think you do too. There's a song that we sing. It said, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. Yep, I believe. And you and I are blessed because of it. Let's make sure we remember that. That we're all somewhat a doubting Thomas. But we can be blessed we move beyond it like he did. Finally, letter D. Verses 30 to 31 are the purpose of John. I wrote these things that you may believe Jesus is the Christ. That's why John wrote it. That's why the Holy Spirit inspired him to do it. That's why we have it and that's why we study it. That you may know. Not, not that you may guess or that you may assume, but that you may know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I hope that this study has proven that to you. We've got a little bit left. Let's take a break, come back and finish all of chapter 21. All right, everyone, it's time to finish our study of John, and we are in chapter 21, a breakfast by the sea, and what we might call the pardoning, the pardoning, the forgiveness of the Apostle Peter. Let's start in verse 1. And let's read through verse 14. It says there that after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going to go with you also. Then they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was him. Then Jesus said to them, Children, ha have you any food? They said, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was him, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciple came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? For they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This was the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. In these 14 verses, I think we find something very fascinating. It, it, it's, it's an everyday event. It, it, it's normal. It's life. These were fishermen. Peter woke up and he said, I'm going to go fishing. And, and, and they went with him. They were, they were there through the night, early in the morning. And from the seashore, Jesus shouts, Did you catch anything? Do you have any food? It's John. John who notices after Jesus tells him to cast their net on that side. But this is extraordinary. To me, that's the epitome of Christ. He makes the ordinary extraordinary. A conversation, um, an action. He makes what we do every day great when he is a part of it. What's so special about fishing, catching fish, eating breakfast, being with your friends? Nothing. 
but you add him to it, and something special comes from it. Notice a few blanks. Letter A, under number four on your handout. There are seven disciples who went fishing that night on the Sea of Galilee. Seven who had been with one another through immense moments. They're, they're no longer in Jerusalem. They've, they've gone home, you might say. Perhaps the, uh, the immediate impact of Christ dying on the cross has, has finally weighed out. Perhaps the, the news of him appearing is starting to filter out. Perhaps they, they, they're just trying to get back to normal. Anything from normal is about to happen now. Letter B. The very next morning, what do we discover? That Jesus was waiting for them on the shore. We don't know where he had been up to that point. Not every day. But we know he had been around appearing to people. And here he is to them. When he tells them to cast their nets, they catch a lot of fish. That they come and they, they sit with him. And let her see on your handout. John says this is the third time that he had appeared before his disciples. We've caught the other two. So John is giving us a list of the times he had seen it and how the group had come to know that Jesus had risen from the grave. And they're about to have this encounter. You and I can go today and travel to Israel. We can ride a train or take a plane, even, even ride in a car up to Galilee. And we can walk the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and one day I plan to be able to do that. And what I want to do is I just want to sit there on the early morning with my family and friends, and, and I want to glimpse what it was like to be there and watch the sunrise. And while I won't be figuratively sitting with Christ, he'll be a part of the group I'm with. And as we share breakfast with one another, we'll have something in common I know, I know Jesus did this. You do too. And seeing it gives me hope that one day we'll be sitting with him as well in eternity. Not, not here, but in eternity. Notice the last few chat verses. There, there's just 10 of them. We won't take a break. We just see Peter's restoration. It's section number five on your handout. Start at verse 15. Read with me. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And I've always pictured that he kind of points. Simon, do you love me more than these? Now, we don't know where they were sitting, what they were like, but, but you can get a picture of Jesus perhaps talking with his hands. Now, I do it a lot. You're watching me, so you know. But I love the idea of him saying, Simon, do you love me more than all of these? Jesus, Simon said, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? This time Peter was grieved, was sad, was disheartened because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Then he goes on to say, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, John says, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what, what about this man? What about John? You told me to tend your sheep, to feed your lambs. You asked me, do I love you? You said, I said I do. Now, what about John? Why are you not asking him that? That's what Peter's doing here. What about John? Jesus said to Peter, If I will that he remain till I come, what's that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple, that John would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but that if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not, tame, could not contain the books that would be written. 
I love the last 10 verses here for two reasons. Number one, because of Peter's restoration, and number two, because of the great, I think the great sentiment about Christ. But notice letter A, that Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Now you and I can see the awesome irony in asking him three times because Peter had denied Christ three times. Do you love me? Well, he said, I love you, when they were gathered together before the trial. And he said, even if all of these abandon you, I'll stay faithful. But he didn't. But Jesus asking him, do you love me three times, I hope was a kind of a little push, a little nudge. I, I remember, do you remember, do you love me? Now, Jesus forgave. You know that. Peter goes on to preach the sermon at Pentecost. Tradition tells us that Peter later in his life would actually be crucified upside down, being carried, as Jesus said, where he does not want to go. But I don't think he ever forgot the three times he denied Christ and the three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? We might deny Christ in our life as well. Anytime you do, may I consider you to have, remember what was done here. Do you still love him? Tend his sheep, feed his lambs, follow him. Last little bit, that special note in verse 25, where there are many other things Jesus did. We don't need to take the gospel accounts as the entirety of Jesus' life. We need to take them as the things that we're taught that we need to know. I've met many people who, when they read Scripture, only look for the questions that can't be answered instead of the ones that are. John was written that you may know Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and that believing in him you may have eternal life. I don't know what Jesus was like as a teenager. I don't know what his relationship was like with his father. I don't know the answer to those questions, and I can't answer them. I don't know what he wrote on the ground when the woman was caught in adultery. I don't know. I wonder, but I don't know. But what I do know is that he made me in his image. That he came to this world because I ruined his image. That I am forgiven because he took my place on a cross that was built for me. And that I could spend eternity in heaven because he spent three days in the grave, but then rose by his own power. I know that. As we have studied John, we, we've seen so many ideas come to the forefront. Ideas like Jesus being the Son of Man and the Son of God. How his relationship with his Father and with the Holy Spirit, how they're, they're, they're unified. They're, they're not fighting, but they're unified. How he wants us to be the same. How he's concerned with his disciples then and his disciples now. And how everything was done so that you so that we would know without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I pray that you know that now more deeply than you did when we started this lesson, this series of lessons so many weeks ago. I know 16 lessons is a lot, but the life of Christ is worth it. All of these were written that you may know. So don't overlook one of them. Value every single one of them. Thank you for being a part of this. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. Next week, there'll be a, a lesson that is shared. And then two weeks from now, we'll start a brand new series of lessons that I'm excited. And I'm going to wait off telling you a little bit about because I don't want to quite spoil the surprise two weeks in advance. So I'll see you personally, me and you, in a couple of weeks. I pray that this has been a blessing, that you're having an enjoyable evening with your family and friends. That you've taken time out to study God's Word tonight. Have a great night, my friends. It's always good to be with you.